All right, well, why don't we get started? Um, welcome to the first Grand Rounds for 2021. It's already been an interesting year. <laughs> it's only been a week. Um, so um, thank you all for coming by. And I hope everyone had a peaceful and joyous um, holiday season. Um, it is my absolute pleasure, pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Nancy Spector. Dr. Spector is professor of pediatrics and uh, has multiple hats, uh, including the vice dean for faculty at Drexel University College of Medicine and uh, the executive director of uh, executive leadership and ah, executive leadership in academic medicine or ELAM. And that is where I first met Nancy. She is a national leader in academic career development, in gender equity, mentorship, as well as a highly acclaimed innovator and educator. She's a founding member of Time's Up Healthcare and a member of Proud, promoting and respecting our women doctors. And she's received numerous awards uh, for teaching, for mentorship, for innovation. I'm not gonna list them all, but she has gotten the Robert Holm Award for extraordinary contributions in pediatric program leadership and mentorship from the Association of Pediatric Program Directors, the Elias Aberton Mentoring Award from Drexel. I actually um, worked with uh, Dr. Aberton when he was at the VA when I was a resident. Um, the Miller Sarkin Mentoring Award from the Academic Pediatric Association, the AMA Inspiration Award, and the Association of American Medical Colleges uh, uh, Leadership Award for an individual. Um, and, uh, you know, I think awards do attest to the amazing uh, work that Nancy has done, um, but I can attest from personal experience that Dr. Spector is a tremendous mentor, sponsor, and ally. And no matter how busy she is, and particularly in pre-COVID times, she seems to be always on the road, visiting a different place. Uh, she always makes time to talk um, uh, and provide really helpful and insightful advice, and also is a great connector. Um, and when I've talked with Nancy and needed advice, she said, oh, you should talk with so-and-so and, and helped connect me to the people that were um, helpful and has been a great sponsor uh, of me throughout um, the year. So uh, hopefully all of you will be able to get a sense of that from her talk. Um, and uh, I'll make a plug for ELAM. Uh, it's an incredible program. We've had a number of our leaders in, at UW have participated in ELAM, including myself. Uh, Dr. Nasia Safdar is currently um, uh, in ELAM, Dr. Amy Kine, Dr. Molly Carnes, uh, Dr. Betsy Trowbridge. So um, we've had great success in the program and I know everybody has really uh, gotten a lot out of that program. So with that, I'm gonna hand over the virtual baton to Dr. Spector. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I was told by Clint, I could just leave this up for a second and then Go back because I don't know what it is, but I'll go past it. Um, and uh, when Dr. Schnapp asked me to come, I we were talking about different topics to talk about uh, today. And something that has been near and dear to my heart uh, always in the past, but has been amplified as a very important right now, is thinking about mentorship, sponsorship, and allyship. Um, because there is so much happening right now in the country and uh, in our everyday academic world. And uh, we need to ground in some concepts of support that will really help propel all of us through this very difficult time and, uh, and to help us shine throughout all the things that are happening. Um, so I do have disclosures in that I receive grant funding from several federal agencies, and I have co-founded and hold equity interest in a patient safety institute um, that is linked to my work in the IPASS uh, study group. And I receive, uh, receive monetary awards and honoraria, et cetera, not travel anymore, <laughs> from uh, institutions for the, the professional development work I do. I do, um, before I launch into 
uh, the things that we're going to talk about today, I want to acknowledge many, many colleagues who have really supported the work that I'm going to share today um, and have contributed to the concepts that I'm going to talk about. Um, they're from across the country um, and really wonderful uh, coll colleagues and allies. So if, if I could take us on a little bit of a uh, overview of the, the next 40 minutes or so, I'm going to articulate the importance of mentoring, sponsorship, and allyship. I know many of you know all of this, but I'm going to sort of highlight some of the things I think are really important and draw from the literature to amplify that and um, distinguish, though, uh, the continuum of um, uh, advising, mentoring, sponsoring, and allyship, as well as detail strategies of how to expand your network, uh, because networks are critically important, as um, and Lynn just mentioned, um, that networks really help us support our journeys in our uh, academic work and help us make influence and impact in where we want to be. And so, I will state this probably a few times here is that uh, many of us, particularly women and those of us underrepresented in medicine and those of us with intersectionality. So women with other um, uh, underrepresented uh, aspects uh, to themselves under invest in social capital, meaning we don't spend enough time often in our networks. And I'm going to try to make the case that we need to make it, it a priority in our in our academic lives. So uh, Lynn gave me this a wonderful introduction, and I want to just add a few things about myself so you understand why I'm on the journey I am, and I truly am on a learning journey, and I'm on a learning journey for leadership development. I'm on a learning journey to understand all the issues regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion, and uh, every day <laughs> I'm learning. And uh, the learning for me started when I was a very small child. The picture up to the left is my family in the 60s. My parents were both uh, educators. And why this is so powerful for me is that they were they were actually secondary, both secondary school teachers in the 60s. Um, and um, they said to both my brother and I, we could do anything we wanted, but we could not be teachers. And the reason for that is they felt teachers were underappreciated, undercompensated, and they wanted us to explore other options. So my brother went on to be a corporate lawyer and I went on to be um, obviously where I am. Uh, but uh, my parents, interestingly, my father became the director of the curriculum of the Brown Medical School at, at I don't know, probably 25 years ago. And he just retired a couple of years ago at 78 from that role. And it was interesting how our, our lives kind of crossed um, me going through medicine to become a medical educator and he as an educator coming to be a medical educator. Uh, but you'll see uh, the places I trained and uh, many other mentors in my life who've influenced me and my family has been so powerfully supportive. Uh, but I want to point out a couple of people, and one of the people is at the top in the middle next to my little children, um, who are actually now 24, 23, and 21. <laughs> um, I just, they don't want to take pictures anymore, so I keep the little ones. Um, but my mentor at the top, Dr. Daniel Shidlow, uh, was um, my first inpatient medicine attending in pediatrics. And I was the first doctor in my family, and I really knew nothing about the breadth of, you know, career options in medicine. And after my first rotation um, with him, he said to me, you need to go into academic medicine. I had no idea what that meant. And he spent it, like his entire career actually helping me understand that. He is still my mentor to this day. He's now retired and he is, um, the retired Dean of Drexel University College of Medicine is and the person who appointed me to my ELAM position. And I can't even just share how important his influence was, was for me and his sponsorship. Um, and uh, if he hadn't said those words early in my career, I don't know where I would have been. Many of the other people in this uh, picture have been so influential to me. And, um, and I, I pause because Many of them helped me understand where my mission was. What did I want to do? 
And I was um, very fortunate to receive an award that Lynn mentioned um, around mentorship. And one of my mentors called me and said, what is it that you really want to do with your life? Where do you want to make impact? And he, he talked about uh, patient care, which I love, um, and the importance of one-on-one -on -one patient contact. And I thought, you know, it is so amazing in my current roles and the roles I want to do that I have the opportunity to help others advance their careers so that they can make impact and have huge influence. And it gives me chills to think of the number of people I've been able to work with through ELAM or through other programs in, in my own institution to help them lead at the highest level to make the biggest impact and influence on on patients in the country. So that that's really what I'm about. So I, I thought I'd take a second to explain what ELAM is, Executive Leadership in Academic Medicine. Um, it is now, we are in our 26th year. No, we did not expect to be virtual this year. Um, and our goals are to advance women in leadership positions. And I'm saying this because you're gonna hear a flavor of me trying to advocate for women and underrepresented in medicine throughout this presentation. Although white men are still a big priority for me in terms of advancement. Um, so to advance women, to support and sustain women who, who attain leadership positions, because women, when they get into high level leadership positions are often very vulnerable because we're often one of a few at the table and our, um, we have a higher visibility if, if we misstep or if there are issues people recognize and, and are critical in a different way. And finally, to change the culture of academic health care. So our mission, it, when fellows come to ELAM and we have about 60 a year and we have 1,072 grads, uh, we're hoping that they will go back and help change the culture at their home institutions as Dr. Snap is doing as well. Um, so we, again, have over a thousand ELAMs and they hold executive positions at 287 institutions across the country and across the world. Um, and they do come to us from all over the country, from the West Coast to the East Coast, uh, Canadians. We've had people from the Middle East and Europe join us. And it's a really powerful network to be part of. So where are we in academic medicine? Why, why am I framing it around thinking particularly about women leaders and underrepresented in medicine? So we are the majority women, I'm, and I'm speaking about women. Women are the majority of US medical students and we're, the, and we're a third of the physicians, yet we still are not highly represented in high level leadership positions. So currently, as of today, um, of all the, uh, if we're looking at medical school structure, of all the assistant deans, 46% are women. And look at this trend, it's very interesting to me. 46% assistant deans, 39% associate deans, 33% senior associate deans, and currently today, 18% interim and permanent deans. And by the way, our group, we track every day who is, um, retiring or moving on for their, from their deanship or and who's being onboarded. But we hover for many, many years around this 18%. And why is that important? If you think about it, at the assistant dean level, most of those roles, many of those roles are very service oriented. For instance, mine, um, you know, I was the associate dean of faculty development. Um, my colleagues who are in diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, there are many other service roles. As you ascend in the decanal positions, you have more power and influence and resources. And those roles tend to go to men. So even at the senior associate dean level, for instance, the dean of research or the dean of finance, they have resource control. Um, and then, of course, the dean is the ultimate. So we, we have disparities and we, have a, we definitely have a pipeline issue. If we look at statistics from the WMC, just in terms of rank, um, and so your discipline, internal medicine, if you look at this, 24% um, of the full professors are women, 17% um, of the department chairs are women, and that, but that is not 
dissimilar across other medicine disciplines or across other fields like dentistry, pharmacy, and public health. So again, we still have a gap that we have to think about. This is powerful work from um, Dr. Reshma Jagsi and her colleagues. Dr. Jagsi was a, a fellow at ELAM last year, and she's at the um, University of Michigan, and many of you probably know her. If you see on this, this graph, if you look at the blue line, uh, that represents all department chairs, interim, acting, and full department chairs, and their ascension across time um, of women ascending in numbers. And if you look at the orange line, that's medical school deans. And their work, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, so peer reviewed, shows that if we go at the current pace of increasing the number of women at the table for these positions, we will not achieve equity, men and women at, in these roles, until the year 2070. So I pause there because if you think about it, that's 49 years from now. So that's pretty intense. Um, if you think about compensation, this is another issue for us. Um, research demonstrates across fields in many different um, studies and very well done that women um, still make 70 in medicine, 76 to 90 cents on the dollar that men do in academic medicine and private practice. So we still have pay gaps, and that's a really important thing that we need to think about. If we think about this from an academic perspective, there are other disparities. So the number of women on editorial boards, for instance, for our journals, um, the number of women is increasing, but the number of women who are the editors is still, uh, there's a very big gap. And depending on the discipline, um, the women on the editorial boards, um, the numbers are really, uh, really very um, disparate. And this is a study I did with um, several other uh, women, including Dr. Julie Silver at Harvard, who publishes quite a bit in this realm. And we found in pediatrics, there's a huge disparity. And if you think about it, uh, my field in pediatrics, 73% of the field are women. And yet, we have a huge disparity in the number of women and men um, who are at the top. And why is that important? Because the decision-making comes from the top. And so there can be unconscious bias that flows all the way down through the process about you know, who is you know, who's invited for a commentary, um, who is selected to do a special edition of something. And so there's a lot of, of unconscious concern in, in that disparity. Um, Dr. Silver's work ex expands to plenary speakers. If we, we've looked and you know, you'll see increasingly in the literature in pretty much every field now, people are writing about the numbers of men and women who are invited to be the keynotes or the plenary speakers. And there is great disparity. And again, that's important because you're chosen to be a plenary speaker because of your content expertise. And so that's a recognition of your contribution. And so we have to be very careful about how we think about these things. Other things for academics that are important to consider, and this is a recent study that Dr. Silver's group did, um, was thinking about citizen, citizenship and, and, and the task and the, um, the tax there. So, um, Citizenship is really critically important to run the missions of our institutions. We all know that we're asked to serve on committees, be you know, part of search committees, um, do the work that will help uh, advance our missions. But we are often uncompensated for this work. But disproportionately women and underrepresented in medicine are asked to participate for many reasons, now for good reasons and that we're looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion in a different lens, but that pays, there's a tax there in that we're not spending time when we're on a committee or doing uncompensated work, we're not spending that and on clinical efforts. So our, our views are not as great or we're not producing um, the articles or the science that we need to do. There've been some recent cat catalysts that were all 
very aware of. Um, the Me Too movement, um, the COVID pandemic, and Black Lives Matter that have really amplified the issues and in a fortunate way, started to help us move resources in our schools and our departments to these issues of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. However, at the same time, um, they have been, um, it's been challenging because white men are usually leading the direction of how we respond to these movements. Um, the gender uh, issues related to the pandemic um, have been amplified. Uh, I'll, I'll share that I've, I've written a couple pieces um, recently, commentaries for JAMA and other pediatric journals about the impact that COVID-19 has had on people um, because uh, it's just an overwhelming situation for all of us. And uh, it's clear that the increasing demands at home um, and other issues have provided us less time for research scholarship, have ex are exacerbating the leadership gap. For a while, I was really concerned because search firms were reaching out to me in my ELAM role asking um, for help because women were not putting their hat in the ring to apply for high level leadership positions. Um, and sharing that you know they were doing what they need to do they were taking care of the covid 19 issues at home they were taking care of their 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 families um and for very good reason but what was happening is the searches continued to move on and women and people under representative medicine were not putting their hat in the ring so i was really concerned with my colleagues that we were going to expand this gap over time and then burnout is a major issue right now. We know people are leaving our field um, and uh, we don't know the numbers yet, but it's it's kind of um, concerning. The pandemic related to racism is also really critically important. Um, and the COVID-19 and George Floyd's death and the death of other uh, uh, wonderful people has really exacerbated the issues and made us really, um, really take a closer look at, at what we need to do. So before all of our pandemics, <laughs> we at ELAM used to say, we are moving the needle on diversity, equity, and inclusion at glacier speed. So there's a little snail here, it's not a glacier, but not moving quickly. But we're really concerned now, all of us are concerned collectively that with the other uh, is issues that are amplifying where we are, we'll, we'll increase increase that um, disparity across um, um, the gender and diversity uh, work we're doing. So this is where I'm moving into, and that was a lot of background, but I think it's really important to frame that why it's so important right now to focus on all of our networks and to really think about how we're going to utilize and pay attention to and prioritize people in our lives that can help us continue to move our good work forward with all of these other factors happening with us, uh, happening to us or around us. So thinking about mentorship, sponsorship, allyship, and coaching. So a, a, just a couple definitions. So a mentor really is a trusted counselor or guide. I think we're most familiar with this term. And for any of us who've been involved in basic science work, the very traditional dyadic mentoring model is very familiar to us. Sponsorship. This is a really important, important um, concept, which has really taken hold in the last three or four years in academic medicine, brought to us through business. Um, is really the powerful, influential person who provides public support for your advancement and promotion and helps you be successful in whatever they're sponsoring you for. And then the allyship, the collaborator to fight injustice. Let's start with mentoring. We are, again, most familiar with this. Why is it so important? Because we have a complexity of roles. If I interviewed everybody on this um, uh, seminar today or presentation today, I would not find any two of you who were the same. We all have multiple roles. We have multiple bosses. Um, we also have multiple goals or different goals. Um, and also there's a complexity of our environment and that there's turnover of leadership. 
the average um, tenure of a dean is five years. The average tenure of a chair is eight. So inevitably, we're, we're going to have leadership changes, which, you know, as you know, causes disruption, uncertainty. Um, so we know change is constant and rapid. And mentorship really provides stability and grounding and opportunities to perform professional growth while all these things are happening in the background. However, there are great challenges for mentors. I mentioned, you know, the disparity in the number of, for instance, women full professors or uh, people underrepresented in medicine full professors. By the way, our, our data for underrepresented in medicine and as well as um, women of intersectionality, we have we don't have great data and we need to get better data. Uh, so if you're looking for a mentor who is very much like you, sometimes that's really challenging. And the challenges for the mentors are often we don't have effective training. We have time limitations and now exacerbated more than ever. I keep hearing from people that they're not able to connect with the people that they consider mentors because the mentors are overwhelmed with their own, you know, working through all the issues. And then there's mentor fatigue. The really good mentors get over over tapped. And by the way, I show this picture because this really reminds me of my office right now. <laughs> I have to do a big clean out. Also, there are challenges for mentors at baseline in that we have to think about um, how we're mentoring different generations. And there's so many benefits to mentoring in multiple generations, but there are challenges because we have clashes in our, our views or our um, values or what we want to prioritize. And that may not, that may be challenging for us. Um, I focus on millennials because they're a big part of our workforce right now. And millennials, though, are, are really a, a wonderful uh, group to think about because they really want strategic career path, uh, you know, help. Um, they want straight feedback and coaching. They want sponsorship. And they're also willing to provide reverse mentoring. So they're happy to mentor up to, to people like me uh, who are more senior. And it's, it's just a really great thing to think about and what value that is. Where we have to move away from, um, I never really watched SpongeBob, but one of my mentees brought this to me because in the old days, and this was me at the beginning of my career, um, just, you know, please mentor me. Here I'm, I'm here, somebody come and swoop me up. Um, and that really is not a great way to frame things right now in our reality. We have to think more broadly about mentorship. So this, this picture, these two pictures are my own learning community at ELAM, so my peer mentors, and Lynn's uh, peer mentoring group at ELAM. And I think the power of, uh, one of the powers of ELAM is thinking about how your peers, so if you can't find a million senior people who are like you, um, to think about how your peers can mentor you. And what I think is so powerful about these groups is the women in these pictures are come from very diverse backgrounds, have diverse expertise, um, but really have come together to help each other navigate through difficult times. So we have to think broadly about types of mentoring. This con concept of a mentoring mosaic um, was created with a, a, a team of my own mentees when we were thinking about, well, how, how should you think about mentoring? Because there isn't just one person who can do it all for us. So we have to think about the areas that we need support in and think about who can mentor us and think more broadly about who can mentor us from a senior perspective, um, a peer perspective and a junior perspective as, as, we, as we just talked about. So we've created a tool and I'm happy to share this with you. We have a whole like set of educational um, presentations and, and workshop materials for this, but um, this concept is uh, thinking through, okay, what do you need and who should be in your mentoring mosaic? And so uh, this example is Dr. Mario Cruz, who was one of my mentees, um, who um, at the time we did this was an associate program director of mine. I was the program director of the residency program. And he had a research interest in domestic violence um, prevention. 
and he also was a program director, so did many educational um, components of the program. And these are the boxes he completed. These are his own um, in terms of thinking about his primary mentors, research, curriculum development, violence prevention, et cetera. And why I show this is not only just to show that First of all, he has too many people in these boxes, as you can see, um, which is a lot of network to manage. But um, we used it as a professional development tool as he created it. We thought uh, we worked together to think through strategically how he would advance the mentoring relationships or the projects in each of those areas. Um, we used it to inventory the number of people on the list. We used it to think about who his future mentor should be. Um, I do always comment that my initials are NS, so you'll see them all over here, but you'll see I'm never in this box, work-life balance. Um, um, so that's on my own mentoring mosaic. Um, so I do know my limitations and partly working with him on this, I realized that he needed other people to help him think strategically about the work-life balance piece. There are tons of mentoring options. There's functional mentoring, meaning you, you work together on a project. That's again, that traditional dyadic mentoring model of the basic scientists. You come in with a research project, your mentor helps you through that and you, you gain a lot of um, knowledge and skill as well as a relationship as you work through that. There's the traditional dyadic mentoring, which um, many of us are familiar with, with, with working with somebody to think about your career. But peer mentoring and speed mentoring are other components that I've been advocating for uh, more recently. So again, the peer group mentoring, working together with people at your own level to help strategize, but getting diversity in the group, by the way, is really important. And then speed mentoring is just what you think, which is really more advising. Um, a lot of the national societies are using it now where you like set up tables of 12, six on six on one side, six mentees, six mentors, you exchange information and only have a short period of time to really ask very pointed questions, but can be a very uh, important addition. Um, as a transition, I show this slide because this is a peer mentoring group I had when I did a course at, at Harvard, at Harvard Macy. And I show it because I this was an eye opening experience for me because the my co peers were from all over the world. And it really opened my eyes because when I was presenting my work, my colleagues from Japan or, or, or Europe or China would say, why do you do it that way? And I just say, well, that's what we do in the United States. And they really gave me the opportunity to open up and, and innovate. So having, again, diversity is really important. I'm going to just pause briefly to talk about in general networks um, and how important they are. Uh, and they link to, you know, all the aspects of mentoring, sponsorship and allyship, but your network is really important because there are several things we're doing at the same time in academics. And again, this comes from Harvard Business School or Harvard Business Review, which I highly recommend all of you subscribe to and read because um, they're very short reads and you'll and a lot of the concepts we bring into leadership development in academic medicine come from the business world. So your network, operational networking, that means the, the network. So these are all networks you have to continually attend to every day. Operational networking is the network that um, you need to do your everyday work. It's the people who um, support you in your clinical work or your research work or um, administrative work. They're the go-to people. They're, they include the people who know how to do everything. Right, so I have an administrative assistant who's been at our institution for so many years, she can solve any problem for me. Um, and so that's a really important network to attend to. Your personal network is the network that um, is your national colleagues, your institutional, regional, national colleagues who do the work that you love, that you have the most passion for. So for me, it's the, it's the people who work in diversity, equity, inclusion, and leadership development and professional development. And there you go to your national meeting and you connect with them and you're like, oh, I'm in my space. I have people who understand, I have people I have passion, you know, with, and I have people who I can connect with and do projects with. And then the strategic network 
are the people who are at the forefront of wherever you want to go or at your institution. And they're the people who are telling you this is the direction of where we need to go. And you can think while they're speaking, wow, this is where I could contribute. I can help advance by being in this space. So it's a very important network to consider. By the way, this is the, the strategic network. I always say to more junior people, when you go to a professional meeting, so whenever we get to go back, when we have the um, award ceremonies, um, the Lifetime Achievement Awards and all of that, attend those. You know, many junior people will take that as the opportunity to go, you know, do their workout or do whatever. Um, but that's where you hear the stories of the people who are receiving these awards and you have the opportunity actually to meet in them in person. Um, so take advantage of that. Strategies to obtain mentors. Again, we have to think more broadly, but we have to make it a priority in our to do list. So one of the things I advocate for with all my faculty is that you take some space in your month, could be weekly, monthly, to think about how you're going to create your network, develop your network, who do you need to reach out to, or meet with people to strategize how to meet others, and looking beyond what you would typically think about as important mentors is really important. So one of, the, by the way, one of the most important mentors in my life was the Dean of Arts and Sciences at Drexel University, like not in science at all, but she was so critically important to my development when I was about early to mid career in helping me advance and learn how to how to navigate politics. Coaching is an important um, component of what our lives are like. We all know what coaching is um, from you know the sports world, et cetera, really assisting you to advance in some particular area you need to develop. But another area to really think about, and, and you may know a lot about this now, I just did not when I was more junior is professional coaching and the importance of it. So executive coaching for academic professionals is becoming more and more and more common. Um, it is a contractual relationship. It does require money, but the, you know, you should ask Dr. Schnapp about this in your own institution, but, um, more and more often, uh, senior executives in medicine have professional coaches, and it's important to be aware of that because sometimes you're negotiating with somebody who's senior to you, who has a professional coach who is helping them negotiate. Um, but also, it's very helpful for people at different stages of their career if they're thinking about a transition, um, if they need to help, they need help with negotiating for something. Um, so this is a whole very rich area to think about. I mentioned sponsorship. Uh, this is an area I'm quite passionate about now. I think we need to, as academic institutions, develop a culture of sponsorship. We need to ensure that senior people are looking out for junior people and helping them to advance actively. So I like this definition from Catalyst, which is a coach tells you what to do. A mentor will listen to you and speak with you, but a sponsor will talk about you. Why is this so important for women? Again, I know I have that gender bent here, but um, this is from, again, Harvard Business Review. Ibera writes extensively in this area. Um, and this is a little bit old data, but it has not changed much um, in that women tend to have one mentor, at least one mentor, so more often, and it have more mentors than men more often. However, in business, this isn't business, but I think it's true in medicine, we're less likely to be promoted. And why is that true? Because we have fewer sponsors. And that again goes back to that women and, and people underrepresented medicine often under rep, under invest in that social capital. So we're not always there when the decisions are being made or we're not always there when people are thinking, oh, you know, who should do this? And so we have to think very strategically about how to do that. Sponsorship, and these are, there's been a lot written recently uh, about sponsorship and allyship for women and men who are underrepresented. And sponsorship, this is a, a recent article, again, in Harvard Business Review, that sponsorship is critical to black women's access 
uh, to significant training, development, and networking opportunities and, and advancement. Um, and so we have to think very, if we want to change the landscape, we have to develop a, a culture of sponsorship. Uh, Dr. Liz Travis, who is a the vice president of women at MD Anderson and an Elon, so that's what we call our alumni, um, was the first person actually to write about sponsorship in academic medicine. So this is from several years ago, and she's written several other things since. But I really like this definition: public support by a powerful, influential person for the advancement and promotion of an individual within whom he or she she sees untapped or unappreciated leadership talent or potential that can catapult you to rising star status and this is important because when you're when you're the sponsee somebody offers you something you have to think why are they sponsoring me and ask the questions before you say no um, and so this goes beyond that traditional mentorship piece the sponsor definitely has to have power and they have to be able to support you as you move on. This book um, by Hewlett is a great little read. Again, Harvard Business Review. It's a very short read if you want to read more about it. Um, and there are more and more sponsorship programs. I think business does this better than we do. Pharmacy and industry does this much better than us. But there are increasingly more sponsorship programs being delivered across the country. Now I'm going to move to allyship, which also is critically important now. And with the um, the uh, the the things we described that are happening in the background in the country right now, these issues are being amplified. Male allyship, male allyship is incredibly important. Um, and I've been saying recently, so in my role at ELAM, I'm asked to speak quite often. And I've started to say, I won't speak unless I get a, a mixed audience. Because often if, if somebody sees my name and if, I, if I'm talking about gender equity, my audience is mostly women. But really we need to be talking to everyone and we all need to be working on the issues of gender equity and advancement together. Um, I really like this article um, from Harvard Business Review. Again, th this is where they're publishing the earliest stuff uh, that was published in December of this, so just a month ago. And this article speaks to male allies, white male allies, and really is a call for men needing to take an active role here, seeking out talented protégés and thinking about who they're asking to do the next thing or who they're asking to be at the table with them. Um, and so we have to think about on our roles as women and underrepresented medicine, who are we looking for? We need to think broadly about who we're enlisting as allies for us, um, allies for our colleagues, allies for our trainees. And we need to make those connections to make sure we are all moving together. Um, we do know um, there's a lot of evidence. Most men really want to be part of the solution. Sometimes um, men are not sure how. I increasingly, and we can talk about this in a minute, but men are increasingly worried um, that they might say the right thing, do the wrong thing, you know. And the the, the backlash of Me Too has been, you know, a, a concern for many people. So um, what we do know is what men can do is to listen carefully and to call out bias credit women for their work amplify so we all know uh, amplification really came about um, as a term during the obama administration where the women in the obama administration were noticing they were what was happening to them happens frequently a woman at the table would bring up an idea and nobody reacted to it and then a few minutes later a colleague, not a woman, would bring up an idea and everybody would kind of jump on that as a great idea. And so the women of the Obama administration decided that they were going to form a coalition as a group. And every time a woman made an idea or created an idea or spoke about it, another woman would say, as Nancy said, I would like to amplify that or I'd like to add to that, but give credit to that person. And so Recently, we've been moving towards 
having men being very attentive to listen and to amplify because it's a very powerful tool. And then ensuring that um, everybody, but men and women are sponsoring um, everybody. And then adv advocating for policy changes. We, there's a lot we can do in policy changes. Um, in terms of white women, so there's more work being done now seeing, looking at how white women can advocate and ally, be allies for women of color. Um, and there is great disparity uh, when you look at how black women and Latinos feel like they're being advocated for or, or who they have as allies. They, they very infrequently see that white women are allies for them. Um, and they also see that the majority of white employees have never spoken out against racial discrimination at work. So sometimes we're silent. We need to think about how we can be more active there. Also, um, there, this is a great article too that um, from Forbes that, that is worth uh, taking a look at. But what white women shouldn't do is we shouldn't assume we're always an ally. And we need to be on a learning journey. We need to understand. We can't assume we know the answers and we can't always speak up for others, but we need to learn and we need it. We need to take an active listening mode here. Um, what we should do is again, listen and learn, walk the talk, engage and support. Uh, so there's a lot of work that we need to do here. So we need to prioritize efforts that drive cultural change, but we can't do this alone or in silos. We have to do it together. We have to dedicate resources. So thinking about it from a medical school perspective or a hospital, we have to think about it at every level from division to clinic to departmental to the dean's office. And with that, I'm gonna leave you with some, these are the, the most inspirational words I've heard this year. So here we go. Everyone who's worried and scared do not fear because we women are strong. Whatever color we are, whatever shape we are, whoever we are, we are strong women and girls. We will save the world just like the first ones did. And we are very, 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 very worried, but we can make through this and we'll make through it together. Yeah. All right. Bye, guys. I hope that lifted you up. It did for me. <laughs> Thanks, Idara. The highlight of my my day. So thank you very much for listening. And I uh, would love to hear any questions you have. Great. Okay. Thank you, Nancy, for, as always, an inspirational talk. Um, I, I will make a bit of a plug for me because one of the things that you know, I'm a good mentor. I'm actually a, a really good sponsor. And one of the challenges for me coming into this position is not being able to um, get to know my faculty as well as I'd, I'd like to. So I am putting out an open invitation for anybody to reach out to me. Um, and I, you know, sponsorship is very important to me um, and I, I'm pretty good at it. Uh, and it's been a bit challenging for me. So I'm just putting it out there for all of you. Um, there's a number of comments in the uh, question and answer um, from Michelle Kimple, Ellen Paley, Elaine Paley, sorry, Elaine, um, who's one of our faculty here in endocrinology, uh, has published that the pay gap in medicine subspecialties comes only mm -hmm. after you get a tipping point of 25% women entering the specialty. So. Mm. Um, thoughts about uh, the implications of this for uh, leadership, um, for diversity and subspecialty representation. I've seen that uh, in a, like once women enter the work field uh, and dominate, the pay goes down. Yes. No, that's a big concern. Uh, <laughs> the feminization of a field, um, that's a problem for my field. Yeah. Uh, in general, like all of pediatrics or OBGYN, that's a, definitely a problem. Um, I, you know, that's a really challenging and difficult issue. Um, I'm wondering, can, can you send me that paper? I would love to see that paper. Um, it, it, it's a very complex and complicated problem. Uh, and I think we need to be thinking about this at every level. 
And I think our top level leadership have to be really paying close attention to this. The AAMC is starting to do work here, but we still, I, I still don't think we've taken a deep enough dive. Um, so I don't have a, a clear, a, like immediate answer for you, but I think it's a big concern. Okay, great. Okay, um, another question from, or it, from Dr. Chipness. Great talk for, um, Great talk. What's your advice for non-white, non-underrepresented men um, who have historically not had a seat at the table as they may not fit the demographics of um, what is being uh, looked for? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I'm on a learning journey here. And so what my strategy has been I'm talking about it from a leadership perspective. So then I'll try to flip it to an individual perspective. From a leadership perspective, uh, my office has closely partnered with the uh, Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and in our uh, community partnership group. So everything we do, we look very carefully at the diversity, ensuring that we're not overlooking any group. Um, uh, so I think from a leadership perspective, we have to be very intentional about how we think about everybody from an individual per, uh, perspective. I think it's very similar to what I would say for women, by the way, it's so weird that I can't see all of you. <laughs> very, very disoriented um, that uh, you're, you're going to need to um, reach out to mentors and sponsors to help you navigate through everything you do. Um, but I think it's a big concern. Um, I have um, more recently heard uh, concerns from white men. Uh, they're uh, not going to be looked, that they're going to be looked over or other kinds of things. I, I, I think we all, all of us need mentors and sponsors and we need those networks to ensure that we can all advance. So a question from uh, one of your former uh, colleagues, John Frona. I think you were residents oh. together. Yeah, uh, we were chief residents at the same time. Hey, John. <laughs> um, you mentioned one of your connections was with a dean in another school. How do you make connections outside of medicine? Oh, yeah. So there's a there's a a very interesting assignment we give to our ELAM fellows that I used early on, which is called leadership interviews. And anybody can use them. And I can show you, I can share with you, I'm, it's not a, it's like a top secret thing. I can share with you um, how it, it goes, which is basically you reach out to leaders saying, I just want to get to know, you know, your path, how you got to where you are. And you reach out to people and say, can you have a cup of coffee with me or not on Zoom and uh, have them tell their story. And so I learned that in Elam and I learned from my colleagues that you needed to go beyond, you know, your typical group of network. And so I reached out to other deans in my school uh, on medical medicine and I said, could you meet with me and just tell me your story? And it was it was amazing because you learn the values of the institution, you learn their journey and their path, but you also then uh, either get connected to other people or you connect to them. So you kind of have to reach out. I, yeah, I will say um, that was one of the, one of many things that I found very valuable of Elam. It gave me a pass, so to speak to reach out to leaders across the organization and just say, hey, you know, this is my homework assignment from Elam just to get to know you. And people were so um, welcoming about it because you're not asking them for anything. You're not you know, complaining or wanting, it was really a get to know. So um, I definitely encourage people to do that. Um, you talked about uh, the importance of finding mentors and sponsors. Can you talk about what the qualities of a good mentor or sponsor um, or mentee and sponsee, sponsee um, are? And how, how do you make those relationships successful? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I had a couple slides in there 
uh, that I usually use that I took out, which it, 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 it speak to those exact points. There was a, a paper, and I can send that to Lynn. She can send it out. Um, that was uh, it was again in pediatrics, but um, a, a colleague of ours, John's and mine, um, uh, Dr. Stephen Ludwig, who was at the Penn, uh, interviewed lots and lots of academic uh, people about the qualities of mentors and mentees. And uh, they're not, there's nothing that wouldn't, you know, would, would surprise you in those qualities. But I think uh, the main ones on the mentor side are listening skills, uh, trying not to make somebody a mini me, uh, trying to really elicit, elicit the goals of the mentee. Um, and somebody who's actually available. Uh, on the mentee side, there is a great uh, paper by Zerzan that I can send to you also uh, that is mentee-driven mentoring, which is a concept that I've really, like, really embraced since I read that paper, which means the mentee needs to drive the relationship. Uh, it also speaks to chemistry. You know, it's just like any other relationship. There needs to be chemistry, common values, common, you know, getting excited over certain things. So uh, there's some of that, you know, intangible stuff, but on the mentee side, making sure the goals are clear, um, that you follow up as a mentee, that you circle back and thank the mentor and those types of things will really help the relationship. But those two papers, um, that I mentioned can really, um, I'm happy to send them to you and uh, they will probably in more in depth uh, explain uh, some of those concepts. Great. Um, so another question, which is very relevant, uh, resonates with me. Um, the difficulty with finding women willing to apply for leadership positions. Um, <laughs> Do you think we need to change uh, the leadership positions to make them more attractive to women um, or URM um, or how do we get more people to actually apply? Uh, there, that's a complex but very important question. Um, I think there are many factors there. One is uh, what the search firm colleagues I have will share with me and a lot of people who've run searches is women often has to have to be asked more than once. Uh, they also uh, we have all of us, I think in medicine, not 100%, but a lot of us have imposter syndrome. So we have to think about ways to really uh, think, get past that imposter syndrome. I think there are also, um, search techniques that need to be changed in order to uh, Im improve the pool of who's in it. And we have to make sure we don't ser do searches. And this uh, drives me nuts. If people do searches and they just pick candidates to show, to show diversity, but they're really not actually interested in those candidates. So I know I said a lot of things in there, but there, there are structural issues on how to run the searches. Uh, but there are then personal, uh, professional development issues that we need to help uh, women and underrepresented in medicine understand that they're actually ready to go to be at the table and to encourage them and sponsor them to be there. I know there's um, there are studies that take a look at the number of requirement, you know, if a, a job listed uh, oh, yeah. you know, 10 different qualities that they're looking for that um, if a man meets 40% that they'll apply and a woman will only apply if I don't remember what the percent, like 80 or 90 or all of them. Um, and that is a mindset. Uh, mindset we have to get beyond for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. So if I'm an older white man like Mark Juckett, um, who is uh, interested, uh, how, how do you express interest in being a sponsor or mentor for those who would benefit? Um, so I, I guess uh, there are a couple things. I think if I were you, I would read some of the things I shared in the presentation and read the um, articles to get a little more 
depth of that, uh, but list being really attentive to listening to what people's goals are and asking what people's goals are, uh, as well as when you're in the room deciding who you know should be on that committee or who should be elevated to whatever accolade it is to make sure you think more broadly about who you're thinking about. And we all have the tendency, by the way, all of us, to pick people who are like us for things that might be great. Um, so it's really listening and learning. Um, I have been reading like crazy recently um, around the issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, things in, in you know, our, our medical literature. There are so many books out there right now. Um, the more you can learn, the better, but the more active listening and paying attention to what the dynamics are um, and giving people opportunities. So thinking broadly that way is what I would recommend. It's, but it's hard work. It's hard work. <laughs> yeah. So we're running on time. I will um, skip in and ask one final question. Um, can you talk about your perspective on the LGBTQ community and its exclusion from the definition of um, DEI at medical schools? Yeah, I think that's something you really have to think about. We're taking a deep dive in my own medical school to think about that. Um, I don't have all the answers. I just know we need to pay attention to it. Um, and I know there are a lot of issues about how the questions are asked so that we can, um, you know, understand uh, the diversity within our groups uh, and uh, so that we can see color. Um, and, and that's a different, although we can't assume uh, race and ethnicity, uh, but I think it's something we, we critically have to pay attention to right now. So I don't have all the answers, but I, I do know it's something we, we need to focus on right now. Okay, great. Well, we're out of time. I, there's uh, a number of questions that have uh, been unanswered. I'll, well, uh, I might try to, um, I can send Nancy um, that and, um, uh, I will share any information that Nancy sends to me in terms of articles. Um, it would be great actually if you just pulled out the references um, from your talk. Yeah, sure. And then I'll, I'll forward it to the department. Um, so thank everybody. I want to thank everybody for participating and um, coming virtually. I want to thank uh, Nancy in particular for coming and sharing her perspectives. Um, and I'm sure she would welcome anybody reaching out to her who needs some, has some questions or um, uh, is interested uh, in some of these issues. So, um, we'll absolutely. And I'm taking you up on the, uh, the offer to come in person someday in the next someday. Time. We're going to get you. Here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much.